Good morning. Thank you all for being here. If you're having trouble finding a seat, don't worry. <laughs> there's still some left up here. Um, but it's a shame because this is going to be a great panel. Um, it's actually really an exciting time to talk about closing the digital divide. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the Supreme Court, the government just finally weighed in this spring and they said, you know what? The internet is not actually a luxury. It's a public utility. And in doing that, what they really acknowledged was that it's sort of a critical component in creating equal economic opportunity. And if you think about what's happening right now in this sort of push to get internet across America, to low-income families, to rural Americans, it's actually a lot like what was happening in the 1930s, right, with that drive to get electricity into the rural farmhouses across America. And if you think about the incredibly transformative effect that had, you know, the economic benefits, the just compounding transformative prosperity that that unleashed, there's a lot of hope that doing that with the internet could uh, have a similarly transformative effect. So that said, there still is a long way to go. You just hit on some of it. We are talking about 34 million Americans, so 10% of all Americans, without access to high-speed internet. That is about 5 million households with school-aged children. <coughs> Two in five low-income students don't have access to high-speed internet. That's 40% of low-income students who don't have access to do their homework. Um, and actually, I just learned this. Among seniors, among people over the age of five, less than half have broadband at home. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, so with me here are three people who are sort of leading this charge uh, to close the digital divide or sort of seeing the front lines of what the impact of internet adoption can really be. So first up, we have Jessica Rosenworcel. She's a member of the S. FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, where she really does work tirelessly on this issue of closing the digital divide. Uh, most recently, she helped expand this decades-old government subsidy program for phone lines called Lifeline to now include a government subsidy for broadband. The proposal was approved this spring, so that's great news. She's also a champion of net neutrality, and in her four years or so on the commission, uh, she's examined many of the biggest, most transformative mergers in cable and telecom that we've really seen in this country in a really long time. If you have heard of the phrase, the homework gap, that is because Jessica coined it uh, in her traveling around the country talking about the issue. The homework gap is what she refers to as the critical need for you know, kids to have access to the internet to learn. Uh, next up, we have David Cohen. He is the senior executive vice president of Comcast NBC Universal. In that sense, he's sort of a boss of mine. Uh, of course, it's Nages, the nation's largest cable and broadband provider. Uh, he's also the company's chief diversity officer. So he plays many roles, uh, including public affairs, legal affairs, and community investment. His passion project, though, I think you can say, is really spearheading Comcast Internet Essentials. And that is an internet adoption program for low-income families. Internet Essentials provides internet for just $9.99 a month, and in only five years, the program has connected 2.4 million Americans to the internet. He has won too many charitable awards to count. The Washington Post has called him a rock star wonk. <laughs> and then finally, we have uh, Dr. Rob Stein, I know. Um, <laughs> Dr. Rob Stein, who is now the superintendent at the Roaring Fork School District, a local educator here in Colorado. He has worked for over 35 years in education as a teacher, as an administrator, as a college professor. Uh, his career is really focused on working in some of the toughest schools in Colorado, uh, where he does have a proven track record. For example, in four years running the Manual High School, he, uh, student proficiency rates on state exams more than doubled. He has also taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he's been featured as an everyday hero in education. So please help me welcome them. So I think just to start the conversation, I think we should lay out why this is so crucial. And perhaps, Jessica, you're the best person to start with. Um, tell us why you feel children not having internet access, and what you've seen, how it takes a toll on children. Well, thank you. It's a terrific starting question. And maybe I'll date myself, but when I was doing homework, all it took was paper, a pencil, and my brother leaving me alone. And, you know, and that third one was the hardest part. But today, that's no longer true. Seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires broadband access. But data from the Federal Communications Commission demonstrates 
that one in three households does not have broadband. So if you think about where those numbers overlap, that's what I call the homework gap. And there is all sorts of data to demonstrate that that homework gap is real. The Pew Research Center found that there are 29 million households in this country with school-aged children, and five million of them do not have access to the internet. So just think what it's like to be a student in one of those households. Just doing your nightly schoolwork is tough. Trying to download math assignments on a family mobile phone, searching for password non-protected Wi-Fi, sitting in fast food restaurants to get your work done. I think we can do better than that. And I think we're going to need a mixture of public and private sector policies to fix that, to close that divide. All right, and we're going to get into all that. Uh, David, how about from you? You're not just focused on children. Why do you feel it's so important for everybody to be plugged in? So um, I want to, I'll answer that. I want to start with something else, so just because we keep using the word access, and I know the commissioner knows this, but um, we have to analytically you have to be careful because whether it's somewhere between 25% and a third of the country does not have broadband in the home, um, six, seven percent percentage points of that are because broadband has not been built out to the home. So that is what I would call the deployment problem. But three quarters of those homes have broadband built out to the home, but they do not subscribe to internet in the home. And that's the adoption problem. So they're very different. I mean, I, where Jessica ended, she knows I totally agree. We need a mixture of public and private approaches to solve this. And there are different approaches on the deployment side, as opposed to the adoption side. So I think analytically, you have to frame the discussion around those points. I, like the commissioner, have traveled all around the country. I've met, at this point, hundreds of families and kids. Um, I disproportionately meet families and kids who do not have internet at home. Um, and I will tell you, it breaks my heart. There's just no way to say it other than that. And um, the commissioner and I were in an event in Washington, D.C. two years ago, and we were joined by 100 families in the community, low-income families, and these were parents who actually understood the importance of having Internet at the home for their kids to be able to do homework and the stories that we heard from them. There's just no way to say it other than it breaks your heart. We you hear so much in urban America about the problems of urban education and that single family homes and the parents don't care and that's why we're leaving a generation behind. These parents cared. Mm -hmm. They cared, they understood, and they were struggling for a solution and we, we have met parents who drive their kids every night to the parking lot of a McDonald's um, so that you can, they can use the Wi-Fi access from the McDonald's with their kids sitting in the back seat using a smartphone to do their homework. And um, I met a young lady in Miami um, who the superintendent, Alberto Carvajal in Miami, introduced me to her and says, and she was a gifted student. Her mother spoke no English whatsoever. And, she, and he said, explain to Mr. Cohen how you do your homework. Because she was in these programs that she had to have internet access to do that. So after school, she took a bus for two hours to a neighborhood computing center, and then she would get there, and she'd sign up. She only got a half an hour, and she would sign up, and, she'd get, and she would get a half an hour on the computer, and then when she finished that, she would immediately sign up again, and she'd sit elsewhere in the computing center and do her homework that she didn't have to do on the internet, and then she'd get her second half an hour, and then she took a bus for an hour and a half to get home, and she did that five nights a week. And I said to myself, I don't think my kids would have the intestinal fortitude to spend three and a half hours on a bus and then signing up to use a computer. This young lady was going to succeed in life, but why should, why should she have to go through that struggle when my kids and all of our kids don't have those problems? So I really think it's a social justice issue, it's an equity issue, and it is, I mean, I applaud the commissioner, I've said this before, digital divide does seem too wonky. <laughs> um, homework gap is much more compelling. It gets you in the gut. Mm -hmm. and it's a very good way to be able to grab people 
to focus on this particular issue. So, Rob, as an educator, what have you seen? How much of a disadvantage do you think it puts students at to not have access to the internet? Well, it definitely puts them at a disadvantage. I want to back up just a little bit. I think there's, a, I, I too slice it differently. Um, I think there's a content question, like what's the quality of stuff that we're getting over the internet? And, and that's a tangential and actually, to me, more important question um, because we're, we, we have huge issues around the quality of content that we're able to get to kids. Um, it's like any other medium, you know, it's, it's, um, it isn't just the vehicle by which you get the information, it's the quality of information and how you can learn with it. Um, a second is the devices, um, which five, ten years ago seemed to be the hard nut to crack. And, and I guess I'd just like to say that that turned out to be an easier nut, that we now have these devices um, that um, cost like $100, $150 per unit. And so we're at a point where we're able to issue one-to-one -one devices for all of our students. So um, that seemed to be insurmountable. And, and because of price changes, um, that's now within our reach. But then certainly the devices require internet access. And, and just as a user myself, less than an educator, I'm consuming more material via internet than via paper. I read the newspaper, I read my books, um, et cetera. I communicate, um, I don't have a phone line anymore. Um, you know, I have a cell phone and, and so things have gone digital for me and I'm a lagging adopter of, of technology. I'm, I'm the wrong, I'm like the guy that's not qualified to be on this panel. So um, that's what we're trying to figure out is all three of those things simultaneously. How do we get good content to kids? How do we have, make sure they have devices on which to interact with it? And then of course, um, you know, how do, how do they get access to it? Um, Can you see it in your classrooms that. though that students with access to high speed internet I'm sorry, say that. Can you see any kind of impact in your classrooms that students with high, that it, access to high speed? Right now, I'm a little skeptical about impact because what we're seeing is that devices have pretty much replaced. And so, um, you know, we, we, there was a point in maybe the 1940s where the ballpoint pen replaced the quill. Um, there, there's a point now where computers are replacing, you know, handwriting or, or you know, digital devices are replacing books, but we're still interacting with it in the same old ways. Um, and that's back to the content question. Um, but um, that's now how we're, com com um, we're consuming stuff. So it, it's more cost effective for us to purchase the same old textbooks that are remarkably similar to the print versions. If we can get them online. And that's partly how we manage the cost because if we can get, um, you know, give a kid a, a Chromebook is, what, is the device we use with, um, you know, textbooks on it, then, then that's the one thing th through which they can consume. You know, th this right here, actually I have a Chromebook right here. Um, so this is my new backpack, and all of my materials as a student would be accessible through this device. Um, in terms of like, is it changing what kids are learning or how they're learning? Unfortunately, not yet. I think that's a separate discussion, but just to get access to the material, we have to um, solve the broad, broad, broadband problem. Uh, I'll tell you a story, um, and, and I think commissioners heard this story before, it was three or four years ago. And I think, it's I think it's getting to be different now, but I was in Springfield, Massachusetts and doing a round table lunch with a group of educators around what I now should call the homework gap. And a teacher, they were from multiple school, most, multiple school districts in Western Massachusetts, and a teacher raised the following question for other teachers. Um, he had gone to a, courtesy of his school district, he'd gone to a training program over the summer and had been introduced to some, what he thought was very good content, um, not qualified to say whether it was or wasn't, convinced his school district to purchase the content and in the first day of school in September, came back and asked in the classroom, but it was all content that required you to go home and do homework on the internet and interactive. You'd fill out worksheets, they'd get emailed to the teacher, they'd get graded, and then he'd get reports on what the needs were that individual students have. And he asked in the classroom, how many people have internet at home? And only about 60% of the kids raised their hands. 40% of the kids did not raise their hands. And so he said, I immediately felt a conflict. Should I use this software that I think is so good, that I think will really help in the classroom, when I know I am sentencing 40% of the kids in this classroom to fall behind. But do I deprive the other 60% of the kids from this higher quality educational content? And he raised this question and half the teachers in the room said we had the same problem and some of them said we decided not to use the software. You know, there's data now that show that 
nearly 70% of teachers have expressed concern about using digital tools in the classroom because their students don't have access at home. I think we've got to wrestle with the idea that digital equity is one of the defining issues of our day. We have challenges with it domestically, and I think focusing on kids and their homework is a good place to start, but frankly, we have challenges with it internationally, too. So let, let's talk about some of the hurdles and then move on to a bit of the fix. Um, it sounds like, what do you think the main hurdles are? Is it that you can't bring the cost of broadband <clears throat> below 999? Is it lack of access to devices? What do you think are the key, or, or other things, cultural things? What do you think are the biggest hurdles? Oh, well, I wish I could tell you that there was one single hurdle and we could clear it. Um, but I think that there are many of them. David alluded to some of this earlier. We have some portion of this country that is extremely rural and deployment there is hard. The economics of deployment there are challenging. So that's one set of issues. We've also got cost issues. We have households that find that this is a cost that they can't handle. And we've got people who don't see the value proposition in being online. And disproportionately, I think many of those people are elderly. And then we have also communities that are not comfortable with recurring contracts, possibly because of their status or because they can't rely on having consistent income. We're going to have to figure out how to address all of those things, and they're going to take a lot of different solutions. So I spend, as, I spend a lot of time talking about this subject because um, when we, when Comcast decided to create the Internet Essentials program, we were obviously focused on the adoption side, not on the deployment side, and we wanted to understand what the barriers to adoption were. And I think with a blip here and a blip there, I think there is a real consensus among, among all researchers who have looked at this question that there are three major barriers to broadband adoption. The first, the largest, the most consequential, the most significant, and the most challenging is a bucket of digital relevance, digital literacy, um, digital, the value proposition issues. This population doesn't know how to use the, doesn't know what the internet is. They might be afraid of it. They don't understand the value proposition to them. Um, they, um, they don't know how to use a computer. They're afraid that they're Kids will be subjected to approaches by child predators. They're afraid that their privacy will be invaded by the government. It is this whole collection of why do I need the internet? Isn't it dangerous? And I don't know how to use it anyway. So I think all the research demonstrates that that is the dominant barrier to adoption. As, a, as the largest ISP in the country, I will say, that it is totally fair to say that the number two and num that the number two and three barriers to adoption are the cost of the service and the cost of the equipment. Still an issue, and cost of the equipment includes cost of wiring in the home, all of those things. And that is why, when you segue to your to the, the to the next subject, it is so challenging to attack this because if you just try and deal with one of these barriers, you will not be successful. You need a comprehensive wraparound approach where the, so the government, by way of example, in reform of Lifeline can help mm -hmm. to attack the price side, but unless the government also approaches price and accessibility of equipment and that first dominant bucket, Lifeline reform alone, I predict, will not materially move the needle on closing the homework gap. Just one other cultural hurdle that um, I think, Rob, you and I were talking about yesterday. You said you have some students, I believe, whose parents might be illegal immigrants, and there was just a fear of getting broadband in the home because there's a fear of signing up for any government service yeah. or any utility. And I think that fits with that, that sort of, you call it the value proposition, and, and you relabeled it cultural, which I think it is. Let me give a little context. In our school district, which is right down Valley, um, 30 miles from here, um, we have 49% of our students live in Spanish-speaking households, and about 45% of our students qualify for free lunch, which is a proxy measure of, of poverty. Um, so we, we look like America in that regard, more Spanish-speaking, Latino, um, fewer other um, African-American or, or other um, groups. Um, and um, it's not just, uh, it's, 
what I'm learning is that different cultures use different technologies differently. So for example, um, you know, I, I think that the estimate of that, you know, I did the arithmetic on, on, the, on the program that if there's, um, you know, we're about 17% of our households probably lack internet access, which is about 1,000 of our students, um, but, um, so, or about a fifth of our students. Um, when, um, when we um, send out a newsletter, we always send it out in English and in Spanish. And we say click the English link or click the Spanish link. But we have 10 times the hit rate for the English link as the Spanish link. Well, that, you know, part of that is that um, fewer of our Spanish speaking households actually use email. Um, the, um, fewer of our Spanish speaking families actually use the website, many more use Facebook. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's the ways people are interacting with technology. Many more people have cell phones than have, you know, devices like laptops or computers. So we have, I mean, we really have to get to, you know, how do the subcultures interact with technology and, and how do we get them comfortable with it? Um, you know, and, and then technology is a form of literacy. And we know that, like, generally lower income students are coming from lower literacy households with fewer books. And they're also coming with, in lower technology literacy households with fewer, uh, with less access or less familiarity with technology. So now we're a school district and we send a kid home with a computer. And even if the kid can use it, like maybe there's, um, there, there are actually some wireless access points where they can use it. But we've now created a cultural divide in the household. Um, and so we just have a lot of work to do um, around this complex, complex first bucket of, of culture and, and value proposition and selling parents on it. Or, you know, I as a parent, I have kids and I monitor what they do on the internet. A parent who really has no technology familiarity or technology literacy, how are they going to monitor what their, what their kids are doing? And so we're inviting this thing into the household. Yeah, so cl clearly the issue is multifold and that there's no cure-all solution, but um, to start with you on the policy side, so I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Lifeline program. This is a Reagan-era program that offered a government subsidy to get landlines into phones across America, but now, just this spring, they approved to get a broadband subsidy. How far do you think the FCC subsidy or the government subsidy will go to alleviating this? Can 34 million Americans become 17 million Americans? Well, the Lifeline program was a program, as you alluded to, that was created in 1985. And if you remember 1985, President Reagan was in the White House, and most communications involved a phone with a cord, you know, one of those curly ones I recently had to explain to a millennial in my office yeah. how to untangle. Dial in a circle. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're the ones my, my kids call the old-timey phones. Um, in any event, it was a long time ago. And back in the 80s, we decided if you wanted to have a fair shot at prosperity in this country, you were going to need voice telephone service. I mean, that was a big deal. So we chose to subsidize in low-income households voice telephone service. We cut down the cost. And today, even about 12 to 14 million households in every state all across this country rely on this program. But what strikes me most is if you want a fair shot at prosperity now in the digital age, you need access to broadband. I think it has moved from luxury to necessity. I think that's especially true for households with children who now need this for their homework. So the question that the FCC wrestled with could, was, could we take the Lifeline program and update it for the digital age? And we did that this spring, and we made it eligible for voice service, and we made it eligible for broadband and data service. The subsidy is still in the same place it's been for years, so I think it will move the needle in some limited ways. I think it's very important for us to study the first few years of this change and identify in what communities it worked and what communities it did not, and then take that data to see if we can recalibrate the program going forward. Uh, and David, for you in the private sector, you know, of course, there isn't much commercial interest incentivizing you to move into uh, poorer areas. How do you balance your business concerns with the public interest and the work you're doing with Internet Essentials? So um, cable has a certain advantage, a little bit of an accident of history, in that we have built out, we, the entire industry, has built out basically 100% of our footprint that can be built out. That is not necessarily rural America, but whether we're in Denver or Philadelphia or Washington or New York or any major city, all the poor areas are completely built out for broadband. 
So it's so the so the incentive on building is not really an is not really a a poverty issue. Um, the only problem it deals with rural America is just not enough density to justify the investment for build. <coughs> In terms of a program like Internet Essentials, I. You know, I mean, I'm going to speak on behalf of our company in that um, this is something that has become a real passion for the company. It is not a, it is our largest community investment program. It is not a program that we make any money on. Um, but we think is the largest ISP in the country. And when I say we, I'm talking about everyone from the senior executives in the company to the technicians who are installing cable service. We think it's our obligation to step up to the plate and to do everything we can to make sure that we're making broadband available to everyone who lives in our footprint. And um, I'm very proud of the program, but it's, it's not a traditional commercial program. And we don't treat it like that, and we invest in it way disproportionately to the economic benefit or lack of economic benefit to the company. Yeah. And I'm heartened that because I've said this for years, I mean, I've done, I've done 10 presentations with this commissioner, I've done presentations with other commissioners, I've done several hundred presentations around the country on this, and I mean, I keep saying, I, I hope every, every ISP in the country adopts a program like this. It doesn't have to be the same thing. There, I don't know that we have a monopoly on good ideas here. There are plenty of different ways to slice this animal and I will and I will tell you that you know now AT&T after the direct TV deal they will have a program like this charter after the Time Warner cable deal will have a program like this Cox to its credit without a transaction has a program like this mm -hmm. so we're beginning to see a more widespread adoption <coughs> by major ISPs in the country of programs designed to get at the homework app yeah and to be able to make broadband available more broadly, attacking all these programs. But I, again, want to say, we, as we supported Lifeline reform, I think we were one of the few ISPs that was vocal and aggressive to say we need to make this reform. I think it is a necessary element of the overall approach to move the needle. But if we don't deal with the bigger barriers, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that's the FCC's job. It really sort of can't be. Um, but what, what Rob said is absolutely right. It's, we attack this, and a major part of our investment in Internet Essentials is through our digital literacy outreach. And we started, foolishly in retrospect, thinking we could design these programs ourselves and bring them out to the community. That was a mistake. And so we now work through nonprofit organizations embedded in the community, Latino organizations for the Latino community, Asian organizations for the Asian community, and we're getting a lot more traction by local, culturally appropriate outreach, which we're funding and leveraging. And I think you've, anyone who's listening to this needs, I mean, I think not that any one part of a program is not helpful or not even necessary, but you've got to attack all of these barriers to really move the needle. I want to actually, um, first of all, I think you've just addressed the solution to the problem I'm going to raise that we're having, So, um, which is that there needs to be tighter partnerships between mm -hmm. organizations like Comcast and organizations like local nonprofits and school districts to try to bridge these cultural barriers. Um, last night I got on, on the internet, which is one way that you can sign up for Internet Essentials, and started to register myself just to see what would happen. And I entered my name and address and stuff, and then the next screen asked for the last four digits of my social security number. So um, that's actually a big red flag for a large number of our families who might be undocumented or just fearful of, of um, providing information like that or may not have a social. So um, that would have been abort mission right there for some of our subscribers. Now, I, I'm not saying that's the only way to subscribe, but that, would be, that probably would have been a deal breaker for a lot of people. You know, on the other hand, you know, we, know, like, we can probably find out every single individual. I mean, we know our families that well. And we have um, nonprofit partners here in the Valley. There's this wonderful organization called the Valley Settlement Project that's a two-generation approach to um, addressing education and poverty. And, and they go into homes, they, they um, build 
um, understanding as, you know, in the base of the community. And like the three of us could partner so well to really identify those specific needs. And, you, know, you mentioned policy. I think it's all on the ground. I mean, it's about community by community finding these local partnerships so that, you know, when, when we hit a barrier that might, you know, scare people away, we can resolve it. Find the, the students and the families who need broadband, sign them up if they need subsidies. It, you know, it's 10 bucks a month, which is, it, it's doable. I mean, you know, if we, I, I'm estimating that would be $60,000 for our school district of 5,500 kids that are probably you know, that would solve it for a year for them. Out of a $55 million budget, assuming no philanthropic funding, that's probably even doable right there. So um, it, it's, it's back to, to me, the biggest barriers are probably cultural and, and that we haven't yet evolved these partnerships community by community, if, if we're any example, um, to, to, to overcome many of those, not all, but many of those hurdles. What would you like to see? How would you like to see Comcast working with schools like you? I think what will happen after this meeting is we'll exchange business cards <laughs> and we'll talk about like how I'll do you know, better than that. I'm going to introduce you right, to Kareem as right? a man who runs this. This is what it'll be. How you know who are those families? How do we get you know? I, I'm all about very specific data, not you know not five thousand or one thousand, but about you know this particular student who lives in this community, this this mobile um, home park. And how do we get him and his family signed up? And is it, it, what's the deal breaker? Is it that they don't have the 10 bucks a month? Is it that the parents are afraid of having internet in, in the home? Um, and we work with our partner organizations to go household by household. And Olivia, we've done this. I mean, we, we have 28,000 schools in our, in our footprint. So we've done this with, with many schools, with many school districts, and eventually we'll get to all of them. We, re we really will. So it's, it's not a, it's, it's, this is not unique. And um, one of the reasons I spend so much time on the road talking about this is I get to meet people like Rob and find another school district where we may not be doing the job that I want us to be doing. And we hook it up and we figure out a way to be able to work through it. So I represent the federal perspective. And I think <laughs> what we can do at a federal level is to look at the policies and programs we have, and update them for the digital age, but where the rubber hits the road is always going to be local. And I, too, get to travel around the country and speak to parents who are driving their children long distances so they can go to their aunt's house to use their broadband. And I've spoken to athletes in rural New Mexico who come back from their games and sit under the lights in the school parking lot to do their homework. And you told me that the school yeah. put a router in the parking yeah. lot. So uh, actually, the, my, my favorite story involves Coachella, California. And if you're at the Aspen Ideas Festival, you probably think, oh, that's that music festival you know, that happens in April. But in fact, I'm talking about the agrarian community that is outside of Coachella and Palm Springs. It's where a lot of citrus fruit is grown and a lot of other vegetables. And the bulk of the students in that school district are the children of migrant workers. More than half of them are low income, more than half of them are from Spanish speaking homes. <clears throat> and the superintendent of that district managed to get one-to-one -one devices for his students to try to show them a world outside of the farming economy in their backyard. But what he found was that they were sitting in the parking lot by his office at six o'clock at night and even later tapping on their devices, because none of them had broadband at home. So he had these students who were falling into the homework gap, and he came up with a really innovative way to get them out. He installed Wi-Fi routers on the school buses. Because in this ag agricultural community, most of the students were riding in an hour to get to school and an hour to get home. Great idea. And he turned that ride time into connected time for homework, and even better, he took those school buses and he parked them in some of the trailer parks where the lowest income students lived so that those students would have a little more time and their families would start to understand the benefit of being connected. And I think that's such a wonderful story because it demonstrates that we've got lots of local genius that can come up with ideas to bridge the homework gap and to fix this digital divide. So at the federal level, I want us to update our programs, push ideas out there, but in the end, it's going to be local entities getting together, understanding what their problems are, and figuring out how to use the tools we have
technically and with companies and with the government to try to fix it. Yeah, so I, lo I love that example. So let let's talk yeah. a little bit more about what works. You've got routers and trailer parks. I'd like to sh share just a few things that our tech team has done um, to, um, and I actually think these might be interim solutions. I was thinking about what you said about, you know, definitely we're talking about a utility in a transitional period when we don't yet have it in every household, just like plumbing or, you know, many other utilities over the past maybe century and a half. Um, but, um, you know, so getting people to where they do have it or, or spreading it slowly until we have a household by household solution. Um, one thing is that um, we partnered with the city of Glenwood Springs, and you guys will have to tell me how this work techni works technically, but they, they kind of own their own broadband. And so um, they, were they actually worked with us to set up wireless hotspots in, in, a, in, a, in a mobile home community with about 40 of our students live in that, um, in that small, you know, that dense area. And, and so those kids, we are actually tracking their use, um, not, not specifically what they're doing, but that they're actually accessing our school materials and things like that. So in other words, when we, when we got it to their, their, their mobile home park, they were using it, and, um, and that was one solution. Another is just practical. You know, we've, we, we switch our, our, our networks to public after school hours so that anybody in the vicinity of a school can hop on. We're trying to make our lobbies um, secure so that people can come at all hours into the lobbies of the school and, and have um, workstations and, and seating set up without you know, compromising security of the whole building. Um, we're, we're trying to broadcast so that there's spaces you know, external to the school buildings. And, and there are other public entities like libraries that are doing the same in our communities. And so we're, you know, like you don't want to pick up your, 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 your laptop and have to walk to school and sit like in the lobby to do your homework at nice, night, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and because we have these small towns, most of our students live in one of the three small towns that comprise our school district. You know, that's doable. And I think in ur urban areas, solutions like that are doable in the short term. But I think people are being very resourceful about kind of stretching, um, stretching access um, with simple fixes like yeah. that. What else works? You know, you're seeing a lot of municipal broadband uh, efforts. Yes, Google Fiber, you know, is in places like Austin. If you've been in New York City recently, you've noticed the former phone booths are right. now sort of Wi-Fi. You, know, you know what else? Um, so we need more Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is the greatest spectrum experiment that the FCC has done in the last 30 years. It democratizes internet access like nothing else. So clearing more of our skies, particularly in the upper portion of the five gigahertz band for Wi-Fi, is going to be more helpful. But another thing that is happening right now that is really neat is we have libraries loaning out wireless hotspots. And they're doing it in places as diverse as New York City, Kansas City, and little towns like Cherryfield, Maine. And if you think about it, if you loan out for a week a wireless hotspot, for many students, that is the difference between keeping up in school and falling behind. So again, we've got not one single silver bullet, but a lot of silver buckshot. Yeah. Um, how about you? What, do you? what do you think is some of the most I, effective strategies you've seen? So I, so I have a bias. I think the most effective strategy I've seen is internet essentials. Yeah. <laughs> and I, by the way, and we support as a company, we support we that coming. A, lot of the, a lot of the interim solutions that Rob has described. Yeah. So we, I mean, when we were in Washington together, we were not only promoting Internet Essentials, we were promoting a vision by the mayor to have um, computing centers in every neighborhood with Wi-Fi available in the computing center that would also reach outside of the computing center and was also part of an initiative to have um, free public Wi-Fi at all public libraries in Washington, D.C. And, and with Comcast, digital literacy programs. And, right, and the digital, and Comcast supports all of that. I mean, we were providing the, the, we were providing on a courtesy basis to the computing centers um, very high-speed internet, Wi-Fi access points to be able to do that. But the long-run solution, and I, again, I just have a bias because I think about my own family and my own kids, um, the long-run solution has to be to have internet in the home. And we shouldn't settle long-run for anything but internet in the home. And, and so, you know, I, I agree with that because if you really look at the future of jobs in this country, I mean, everyone knows science, technology, engineering, and math are the fastest growing fields in the economy. And we also know that the diversity of those who enter STEM fields does not reflect the diversity of our country. But it's possible we could make more of our population from consumers of internet content into creators. 
And I really think the place you start with that is with homework and with broadband in the home for students. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions in a little bit, but I think some people in the audience might be wondering what's the difference between having Wi-Fi and 3G in your smartphone versus broadband at home? Why do I need that broadband at home? I think having broadband at home with the computer creates creation potential for students that isn't as easy to develop with a small handheld device. I mean, as a parent, I would never say that I would want my children doing their homework on a small handheld device. I wouldn't want them to apply for jobs or scholarship or further their education on a small handheld device. We can do better than that. We can use them for tethering so they create connectivity with our computers. But I don't think today we could say that that is the optimal device to learn and advance your homework on or your education. But could you leapfrog lane broadband by tethering your laptop to your smartphone, which These has are all part of solutions, and I think we should be using all of them and not choosing between them, because this is a problem that's big enough and affecting so many students that I think we have to sort of have an all of the above approach. So there are two, two responses to that. One, I can't tell you how many mothers have come up to me and, and issued the following question, which is, would you, you have any idea in following question in various forms, do you have any idea how hard it is to write a term paper on a smartphone? And every time I hear that question, I say to myself, oh my God. I mean, I am constantly on the road, so I am constantly using multiple smartphone devices to write emails, and I write a lot of emails, and it's painful <laughs> to write a long email on a smartphone. And imagine writing a term paper on a smartphone. So, the, and by the way, Rob, I mean, we, there is, a, there is still a significant debate in, among public educators about what the right devices are right. for students to have. I mean, Chromebooks are a mixture between tablet and, and laptop, but there are a lot of educators who think that tablets are not the right educational tool, that you can do more on computers than you can on tablets. So devices matter, and accessibility to the device also matter. The second thing I'm gonna say, and the, again, the commissioner knows more about this than I do, although there are technical people who know this, but in the current engineering structure, it is not efficient from an engineering perspective or a cost perspective to be doing too much of your data usage through 3G, 4G, LTE, and ultimately 5G. Why is that? Because the spectrum is scarcer, it is more crowded, it is more expensive, Wi-Fi is, if you want to be wireless, Wi-Fi is a massively more efficient, from a financial and an engineering perspective, wireless medium. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why the wireless carriers and the ISPs are in constant contact about how do we automatically shift people's devices so when, they, when you're in the house, if you're on your smartphone, when you're in the house, that you're using your your smartphone on Wi-Fi and not on the network, so you're not using your data. And so there are, there are inherent, at least current, inherent engineering, financial, and technical advantages to Wi-Fi that, that make a wireline, and for Wi-Fi you need a wireline broadband connection somewhere near the Wi-Fi. Um, and so that's the, that's the policy and business advantage of wireline internet connections and Wi-Fi, at least today. Now, someday that may change, but at least today, that would be the answer to the question that, that, that you're asking. And by the way, when we started Internet Essentials, we've done all sorts of improvements all along in response, for example, to comments like Rob's, but the number one comment, I won't even call it a complaint, that I received and that our IE team received around the country was that we weren't providing Wi-Fi. So last year, we added free in-home Wi-Fi to Internet Essentials, and um, it's easy to understand why that's important, um, because now you can not only have a student, you know, the kid doing homework, but now the, now the parent can be using the smartphone or there can be a second laptop, and it's all, wire, it's all wireless within the house, using Wi-Fi, and the wireline broadband service that is now in the household for multiple users on multiple devices. 
I want to officially go on record as stating that I'm not qualified to have an opinion <laughs> about what devices we should be using or what means of getting access like broadband or wireless or, or wired. Um, however, what Jessica said, the devices need to be big enough and facile enough for kids to be able to interact with them in order to live up to that vision that I'm frustrated we're not close to realizing, which is to really having, um, t taking full, um, um, full advantage of the potential. Right now we're consuming, we're not yet really producing in new ways. We're producing in the same old ways um, with all this new technology. Um, so, so to me that's, you know, like, like that's up to you guys to figure that part out. Um, but certainly we're beyond the point where we think we're not gonna need them. I don't know that we want to figure out that we, the ISP, I mean, I'll let the commissioner speak for herself, I was hoping to figure out what the right that. devices are. No. Because yeah. frankly, we take a lot of feedback from school yeah. districts. I mean, right now. That environment's volatile the, too. The These are inexpensive and, and, and workable for us, but you and know. And we do different things totally in different, different communities. Yeah. So right now, we, through Internet Essentials, we make available heavily discounted laptops, netbooks, desktop PCs. Um, we are not currently making available tablets, but we are, and that's because we've gotten a lot of pushback from a lot of school districts. They don't really want their kids using tablets, but some school districts do like tablets. So we're in discussions with certain tablet manufacturers about whether we want to add that as an option to the program. So I, on, I mean, I think the commissioner used the frame partnership at the mm -hmm. very beginning, mm -hmm. and I think this is another space where I don't think any one of us wants to arrogate decision making. Yeah, and the capabilities of all these devices are evolving. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was nine years ago yesterday that the first iPhone went on sale. Contemplate how different your life has been since then. So change really feels like it's happening faster, not just in our commercial lives, but in education as well. And I don't think we know what the optimum device is, but I'm pretty confident saying Whatever that device is, it's one that allows students to not just consume, but to also create. And I think their education and our economy writ large is going to be much more interesting if we have a much more diverse group of students helping create digital content and medium. I'd like to actually tell a, just a little anecdote about, like, um, I think the, the big question you're asking is, you know, is this essential and do we need this? And, and you know, I, I also want to say that, like, these, this is really valued by our students and families, that, you know, even though there's some lack in digital literacy, um, we issued, we've issued maybe 4,000 devices over the past two or three years, and our, our break rate, our attrition rate is about 2%. That is breakage and loss. It's, it's very, very low, and so we think we're going to get a five-year life. And we did an experiment where we, with like probably a couple thousand, we did zone coverage. So we had like assigned to a classroom and kids would use them and then put them back. And then the other like maybe thousand or two thousand, we issued to individual students. And um, the, the, the loss and breakage rate with the one-on-one -on -one issuing to individual students was much lower. Um, so when, you know, kids are valuing these things, are taking, the kids who are taking them home are not breaking them at higher rates than those that we're keeping in the classrooms. Um, that to me is feedback about you know how important you know it, it is to students and families that that we get these devices into their hands and and give them the capacity to use it. Yeah. Oh, all right. With that, I think we can open it to the audience. Does anybody have any questions? All right, right up here, we've got one. We have a woman coming with a microphone. Please just stand as you ask your question. Sure. I have my little iPad here, and it's connected, and it has a little. Uh, keyboard that I bought for $9, and it's actually very, very useful. Um, my question is, I have teenagers, and I know how they use their devices, especially their computer and their tablets, and the, and the, the key function is, and sort of goes to you as, as an educator, how do we help the children and the families understand how best to use these devices in the home, because there's a lot of web surfing, a lot of of Facebook chatting, a lot of other uses of these of these tools in the home beyond just homework. You know, I don't actually feel that qualified to answer that question. I wonder about it too. But as an educator, um, I, I tend to be a little more libertarian than many in terms of feeling that um, we can't overprotect kids from their environment. We have to give them the skills to to, to navigate their environment. Um, but I would say I'm probably not in the middle ground in my views on that. Um, I think there are people a lot more conservative than I am. 
I, I mean, I will say I'm sort of exactly where Rob is, maybe even more libertarian. And the way I put it is that for your kids, for my kids, we, we may monitor what they do on the web, but we are not sitting there looking over their shoulder and saying you're spending too much time on Facebook and too much time on Twitter. And I, you know, yes, we're trying, we have a policy here to close the homework gap and to give kids the ability to do their homework at home, but accessing the internet has multiple other uses, access to healthcare, access to job opportunities, access to news information and entertainment. And I'm just not offended by the fact that you're gonna have poor kids who are now able to go and play a lot of games on the internet and be on Facebook a lot, just like wealthier kids. I don't think that's a big problem. And I think digital literacy training and, and skills and understanding what you should do on the internet, what you shouldn't do on the internet, um, are really important skills. They're important skills for wealthier kids as well as for poorer kids. And it's why we invest um, in a lot of education and training and programs around this in boys and girls clubs and urban league sites. Um, Rob, if you had gotten to past our sign up but had gotten to the digital literacy <laughs> part of the Internet Essentials website, there is some fantastic content on there about how to protect yourself on the internet and to be careful what you do and not to give your name um, when you're on public sites. David, you're going to Roaring Fork after this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. right. All right, next question. Uh, this is Mike Lubin uh, from Viasat. Uh, what percentage of the five million homes are in rural areas versus, let's say, inner city cores? What, what percentage, percentage of, of the unconnected homes are in rural areas versus urban? Um, I'm not going to be able to give you statistics off the top of my head. I think we've got about 6% of households that are in rural areas that are not connected. About 18 million Americans, I think, but we've got households in urban areas that are also not connected. I would say, by and large, those in rural areas are a function of a combination of lack of deployment and cost, whereas in urban areas, it is more likely to simply be cost. Yeah. I would also say Pew has done a lot of research into this, and if you want hard numbers, that's probably the best place to go. I will tell you, I don't know the answer either, but the overwhelming majority of those five million homes um, are going to be homes where broadband is available, but it's the barriers to adoption that are preventing access within the home. Uh, uh, so uh, my name is Mabadou Anjai. I'm with Jobs of the Future, an organization based in Boston. So we, we read about um, all these rankings uh, of uh, countries, countries around the world that have better access to broadband than the US. I think the US is usually ranked 20th or 25th based on the one you look at. And a lot of these countries are in Western Europe or in a Asia. And I wonder, you know, especially in terms of policy, what, what are we not doing or what, it, what can we do that these countries are doing to increase access to broadband here? Now, obviously, these countries are smaller in size than the US, that's obvious. But in addition to that, is there anything else that we, we should be doing here in terms of policy to, uh, to increase access to broadband? The question is, in lower income countries, what co policies? No, it's, it's actually here. I'm, I'm asking uh, these other countries in Western Europe and in Asia. Uh, yes, like the UK has a higher broadband penetration right. rate. So, right, so what are they doing that we're not doing? All right, well, you're right. We need to do better. These are the roads, highways, and canals of the digital age. And I think the United States needs to work harder to have the best in the world. I think some of the countries that you mentioned have some benefits associated with more urban populations, less rural areas. So we're going to have to manage those realities, which are part of our geographical union. But I think we need to do more with respect to competition and encouraging competition in those areas that will sustain it. And we also need to do more to promote next generation technologies, like for instance, 5G wireless technologies, which use really high band millimeter wave spectrum and could deliver much higher capacity services over our airwaves, capacity services that we, we have traditionally only associated with fiber facilities. So I think it's a mix of more competition and new technology. And also we've got to make it a big focus of our nation's policy agenda.
So I'm glad we're in the last five minutes because this may be the only place in this space where the commissioner and I have you don't at, least want a little bit, at least a little bit of a disagreement. Yeah. Um, I do agree with her. We, we constantly need to do better. The statistics that people cite about international comparisons are all over the place. I can cite you a whole set of statistics which would lead you to the completely different conclusion, including the statistic that the United States has every year consistently for entry level broadband is in the, in the bottom three in the world in terms of our pricing for entry level broadband. Um, and um, I, I disagree with the, with, the, with the single statistic that the United States is 15th, 18th, 20th, 23rd in the world in broadband deployment. The commissioner made the right point, which is a lot of this is density driven. So in fact, if you take the top 10 if you take the top 10 governmental units in the world for broadband adoption, five of those 10 are United States states. Um, and they tend to be the higher density United States states where broadband adoption rates are much, much higher. So, and then with all due respect to the commissioner who I love dearly and respect, I don't think competition is the solution to this because many of the countries with the highest broadband adoption rates have the least competition, and it's because they have 100% or 90% funded governmental broadband networks, um, and there's no competition um, in, those, in those particular countries. So um, I happen to think we have a fair amount of competition in the United States. I think competition may help drive broadband. It may help drive broadband pricing, but the real solutions around adoption are the rest of the issues that we've been talking about today. All right, one or two really quick questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Erundu Juchizam. I am a piercing scholar. I recently graduated from a college in Vermont. As small as my college town, the main street have Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And you may mention of in order to close the digital gap, the homework gap, we need to partner. There's, there need, there's a need for pri private and public partnership. Is there a way through your office you can partner with local authorities like town managers? Because uh, the Wi-Fi on the main street of my college town mm -hmm. set up by the town manager. The question is about local government partnerships with local entities. One of the things that I was hoping that at some point we could figure out a way to start, perhaps at the FCC or maybe it should reside elsewhere, but I feel like we need a clearing house for these solutions. We have creative things, like I mentioned, that were happening with school buses in Coachella, California. They've been copied in Alabama and Indiana and other places. We have libraries loaning out wireless hotspots. We have communities that have gotten together and identified commercial establishments where students can come do their homework and the Wi-Fi is free. We need to start figuring out how to make all of those solutions available so that mayors can look at them, so that small towns in Vermont and big cities can look at them and see what's worked so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And that's something that I'm hoping we can find a way to do going forward because I think we can all learn from each other when we try to solve this problem. We have one more question in the back here. Uh, sorry, please. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think this is a Gutenberg moment. And the, uh, if you think about when we first got books and how important it was to disseminate the books and to teach everybody to read, we ought to really be working with the libraries, making sure every library has this ability, is teaching people with the museums, every, wherever, not just the homes, but wherever this could be taught. And I'm, I'd like your comments on that. I don't yeah, a lot of people say, why do you need broadband in everybody's home? Can't these kids just go to the library? I, I, I want to actually, uh, I'm not sure, but I think I disagree that we're in a Gutenberg moment in terms of education. There's a great photograph that these guys, um, David um, 
Tyak and Larry Cuban in a book they wrote that's a history of ed education reform over the 20th century, 1927 aerial geography lesson. Teacher in an airplane standing in the front of the plane with all the kids with traditional desks bolted to the floor, facing forward and looking as the teacher points to a globe. And so here they are in an airplane, and instead of looking out the window and experiencing the world, it's set up like a traditional classroom, and that pretty much summarizes where we still are. We've, we've in a, we have textbooks, kids have um, disposable paper, we had chalkboards, we had incredible technological innovation before the computer throughout the 20th century, and we're still teaching like we were teaching in the 19th century. So that's why I say the content has not yet caught up. Now, we may be in a Gutenberg moment, but this may just be a shift from you know, chalkboards to whiteboards to um, TV displays. And, and I'm pretty skeptical that, that, that Gutenberg is, is, is here in this moment. I'm going to let the commissioner yeah, have no, the I'm final totally word. I'm totally going to go for it. I think we are in a Gutenberg moment. I think these are early days. But there's something, I'm not an educator, so take this with a grain of salt, but there's something crazy that we still have this process of buying science textbooks every seven to ten years in our school districts. We can have so much more interesting content. We could have Steven Spielberg-like production values taking us through the universe. We could interact with that. We could have adoptive technologies that are built into our learning and our digital age textbooks. And I think we're just in early days of figuring out how to optimize all of that. But when we do, learning is never going to be the same. And start calling it the homework gap. <laughs> Not the digital divide, thank you.